The pirate Yellowbeard captured many other galleons, killing over 500 men in cold blood. He would tear the captain's hearts out and swallow them whole. Often forcing his victims to eat their own lips, he was caught and imprisoned for tax evasion. But despite years of rehabilitation and torture, he refused to divulge the whereabouts of his treasure. This is Yellowbeard, or should I say, this be Yellowbeard, the 1983 pirate comedy starring pretty much every relevant comedy actor of the time. It originally started with uh, Keith Moon, the drummer of The Who, saying he'd love to be involved in an adventure movie. It was the, uh, the result of making the deal before they had anything else. Uh, he offered us some money to develop the idea, which he had in his case with him at the time. And he said, I got a great idea. Why don't we do a pirate movie? That sounds like good fun, and we can um, go and shoot in nice locations. And so we started writing it. I read the script, and it's a very funny movie. Everybody's funny. These funny guys get on a ship, and they, you know, they bop each other over the head. You know, somebody falls overboard. They're saying it's very funny, which is usually the kiss of death. You know, if you enjoy seeing blind beggars being robbed, this is the movie for you. Notorious pirate Yellowbeard attacks an Inquisitor's ship and seizes the vast amount of treasure on board. His second in command, a pirate called Moon, gets his hand chopped off for touching Yellowbeard's booty. I said, hands off! Do I have to do everything myself? A narration explains that shortly after this incident, Yellowbeard was arrested for tax evasion and sentenced to 20 years hard labour in prison. Pathetic, taking the easy way out like that. How do you mean exactly? Dying. He'd only been in 15 years. You won't catch me dying. They'll have to kill me before I die. He is visited by what I'm going to call his wife, though it seems that all kind of acts seem to have happened without her consent. She informs Yellowbeard that he has a 20-year-old son and he is a gardener. A gardener? A Yellowbeard gardening? I'll see about that when I'm out. What is it now? Time's up, sir. Yellowbeard breaks out of prison and goes to his former residence to find the map to the treasure he stole two decades ago. His wife says she threw the map out years ago, but went to the effort of tattooing it on the child's head when he was young. Where is he now? Lambourne Hall. Right, I'll go up there and cut his head off. Yellowbeard goes to chop his son's head off and finds that the boy has been raised by a member of the aristocracy as though he was his own. Is your name Dan? Yes. I need your head, my lad. You're my father. So your mother says, but that's no reason to believe it. Never trust a woman or a government. Yellowbeard's son, Dan, offers to go with his estranged father in order to find the treasure. They devise a plan to get to Jamaica under the guise of a botany expedition. Uh, we must find a name for you. Uh, uh, Professor... Uh, Professor Floss. Professor Death. Uh, Professor Chair. Professor Wright. Uh, Professor Clark. What about Professor Anthrax? Oh, yes. And they ready themselves to leave Portsmouth, but Yellowbeard's former first mate, Moon, is on their tail. Moon takes over leadership and forces Dan to follow him, but Yellowbeard is secretly stowed away on board, and by night he alters the ship's course. <laughs> when the island comes into sight, Yellowbeard leaps off ship and swims ashore. The Spanish Inquisitors have a fortress on the island and Danis is captured and held hostage until Yellowbeard reveals himself. Silence and obey or I shall kill your captain. Ah! Yellowbeard! Ah! Moon arrives and a sword fight ensues, but Yellowbeard slips away. Oh, you made me forget what I was, you stupid little sod. What were you doing? Shut up! Did I just say stagger or was it crawl? I don't know. It was crawl. Or was it crawl to the right, crawl to the left, or crawl, crawl, then to the right, then stagger? Or was it, oh bugger me, you've sodded the whole thing up like the stupid little twerp that you are. Dan finds Yellowbeard retracing his footsteps on the beach. He shaves off Dan's hair to reveal the map and they find his treasure. Congratulations, Father. <laughs> but I didn't... You are a Yellowbeard. What? Killing your father as I killed my father before me. Dad, the blood. Blood. 
That's what I like to hear. You are my son. The yellow beard is sort of a, a vaguely nasty... Well, not vaguely, he's very nasty. Very nasty. Really, yes, the most unpleasant pirate ever, really. He was to poke your eyes out as soon as look at you, really. Yeah, yeah. Mm. just an all-round nasty one. Yes, oh yes, no where, where did the, feature at all. Where did the idea come from? Uh, actually, it was Keith Moon, uh, an old drinking companion of mine, some years ago, about six years ago, suggested I wrote an adventure comedy. And looking at Keith, he reminded me uh, in, a, uh, in appearance of, um, uh, in Treasure Island, uh, Long John Silver, played by Robert Newton, yeah. right? Looked just like him. And also Keith rather behaved like a pirate. He did whatever he felt like doing on the spur of the moment and didn't give a damn about the consequences, yeah. which is very piratical yeah. in behaviour. So that gave me the idea of, of pirates, and that well, it was the seed of it, really, and uh, started to write it some time later. Did yeah. you have Keith Moon in mind for the part? Uh, he would indeed have been uh, in the movie, yes, either playing Yellowbeard himself or, uh, or his arch-rival, uh, uh, who in fact we named Moon uh, after him. Oh, yeah. really, in memory. Although Keith Moon was not in the film, a whole host of comedy talent was, including, but not limited to, three of the cast of Monty Python, John Cleese, Eric Idle and Graham Chapman, four members of Mel Brooks's regular ensemble, Peter Boyle, Marty Feldman, Madeleine Kahn and Kenneth Mars, both Cheech and Chong, one of the goons, one of Beyond the Fringe, one of the young ones, and to top it off, James Mason, Michael Horden and pop icon David Bowie. What days when you feel you've done it? You know, you've done a good scene. You know it. What? It's a catharsis. As Dorothy Parker said about writing, I enjoy having written that. Well, I enjoy having acted. Um, it works all the demons out of my system, exorcises them. I, I used to be rather violent before I became an actor. I was always getting in fights. Uh, it's obviously, I've sublimated my violence and found a way of using it uh, in my acting. This would be Marty Feldman's last movie role, after suffering a heart attack while filming in Mexico, bookending his on-camera comedy career with two of the members of the At Last the 1948 show. Who'd have thought, 40 years ago, that we'd be sitting here drinking Chateau de Chasselas. I would have been glad of the price of a cup of tea then. Ah, a cup of cold tea. Aye. Aye. Without milk or sugar. Aye. Or tea. Aye. <laughs> and out of a cracked cup at that. Yeah. We never had a cup. We used to drink out of a rolled up newspaper. <laughs> Best we could manage was to suck on a piece of damp cloth. Aye. But you know, I often think we were happier then, although we were poor. Because we were poor. He's probably the nicest man I've met in a long time. He really is. He has an ability to become one of the natives wherever he goes. People flock to him, he magnetises people. I was pleased to see that Peter Cook, who is often accused of being somewhat wooden in movies, gives a very good performance as a naive and inebriated member of the aristocracy. You're my son, prove it, kill this stupid old bugger. Oh, hold your horses. Well, I can't kill him, he brought me up, just like a father. Oh, you mean he's beaten you and kicked you and smashed you in the teeth? Yeah. No. no, he's been kind and gentle. What kind of father is that? Kill him. No. All right. Oh, do it. Oh. No, don't, don't. Graham Chapman plays Yellowbeard exactly the same way as if they had cast Animal from the Muppets. <laughs> and Madeline Can steals every scene she appears in. Hello, sugar jaws. What, you again? Again? I haven't seen you for 15 years. What is it this time? Martin Hewitt was a relative unknown at the time, and remains one now. But somehow he beat out Sting for the role of Yellowbeard's long-lost son, Dan. Can I have three farthings for a lump of shit, please? I beg your pardon? I said, can I have three farthings for a lump of shit? No. And I have nothing against Cheech and Chong, but they are best served in their own movies. Here it feels like they've been cut and pasted from a completely different film. Yes, King Carlos should be very pleased. Tell me, who is more important to please? The King of Spain or God? Well, God, of course. And who is God's personal representative in this vicinity? <laughs> well, you are your blessed rectitude. I can't do a Spanish accent, so I, I did a lisp instead. It was like a Castilian, where he just talked like he had a speech impediment. When the invaders reach the throne room, uh. my men will rise up and dispatch all with majestic heavenly force. Magnificent strategy, your arrogance. 
I feel that the major flaw in this movie is its consistency. At its best, it could rival Monty Python. At its worst, well, it couldn't. With so many side characters, everybody wants their moment to shine. But as a result, the audience gets drawn away from the yellow beard story. I'm honour bound to ask this question. Is there anyone here who does not wish to be a member of Her Majesty's Navy? Peace, sir! This was a unique opportunity for James Mason to give his opinion on the script. He actually shot one of the writers. This book, which I've had for some time but I've only got round to reading recently, has a draft of the screenplay in it, credited to Graham Chapman and Bernard McKenna. It's actually an earlier draft of the screenplay which has quite a different opening and a different ending to it. also has a novelisation, which I must admit I haven't read that. But the script is actually quite a lean version of the story. It, it follows the Yellowbeard story much more. In the actual credits of the book, it lists four names on the screenplay credits. In the film, it only has three. Here it's credited to Graham Chapman, Peter Cook, Bernard McKenna and David Sherlock. David Sherlock's not credited on the movie, but was uh, Graham Chapman's boyfriend of the time. According to the introduction, Peter Cook and David Sherlock both worked on one draft of the script each, although Peter Cook must have had more input than David Sherlock, as his name is on the finished film, but that might be because he was more of a star name. Graham, is it true that Mason really hated the script? Well, I'm a bit busy at the moment because they've got this. There's another of the executive writers on our movie, Bernard. Excuse me. Oh, oh sorry. Are you busy. a writer here? I'm too busy. Oh, come on. Come on. Let's go. Let's go over with you. No. I just want to ask you Look, something. I'm far too busy. I've got things to do. Excuse me. Please, do work. No. I asked you for some suggestions of what you think are movies that are genuinely so bad they're good. Loads and loads of responses to that. This from Brian, Yellowbeard is so bad it's good. The film is such an incoherent mess but its lack of polish and structure genuinely work for it. It really is completely bonkers. Just thinking about Yellowbeard makes me laugh. The interesting thing about Yellowbeard is this. I remember John Cleese saying that he had done Yellowbeard because it was a Graham Chapman project and he did it because he really, really liked Graham Chapman and describing it as one of the six worst films ever made. However, there was also a quote from Eric Idle, which I found, which I'd forgotten about. He said, sometimes the best times can be on the worst movies and vice versa, e.g. Yellowbeard, which I wouldn't have missed for the world. And this completely chimes with something I've said loads and loads of times. The movies that are the most fun to make for the people making them are often the least fun to watch for the audience. This here is Rye in East Sussex, and it doubled for Portsmouth in the film. And as you can see, it hasn't changed much in the 40 years since it was filmed, nor the 40 years before it. This doubled as the courtyard in the film. Graham Chapman ran up those stairs. Dan had some shit thrown in his face over there. This area here was all covered with straw and mud to cover the road markings. And that shop there had its windows blacked out with sackcloth. This is the road that Graham Chapman walked up after he stole the loaf of bread. It may look a little different because in this area up here, they composited it in ships to make it look more like Portsmouth. The Mermaid Inn, however, is real. This is just a little bit further up the same street. And it was there that Eric Idle stood, whilst Peter Ball and Marcy Feldman pretended to make out here. This black and white building to my right was the main fox in the film, the main tavern. It was outside this building that John Cleese, Eric Idle and Nigel Planer had their interaction, before Blind Pew was tricked by Marty Feldman into a shed and blown up. The rest of the film was shot in sunny Mexico. At the end of a day's filming of the unreal thing, suddenly it's time for the real thing. Yes, 
Coca-Cola. On a film set, it is the director's job to marry the technical with the theatrical. So the tone of the production really should have been down to Mel Damsky. Mel Damsky, who is the director, has had an enormous background in television, understands tight schedules, understands uh, the proper coverage. Billy Wilder said, if you have a funny bone, you, can, you, you, know, you make good choices, and his instincts are right. Beautiful day, and we're shooting inside all day. In fact, one of the reasons they hired an American director for this is they wanted it they didn't want it to be too English verbally. But I think sight humor and the kinds of visual humor we've done are universal. Nothing really shows the inconsistent tone more than the film's marketing. In Germany, this is how the film was released. I'm told that translates to Monty Python on the High Seas. In America, it was sold like this, making it look like a Cheech and Chong movie. In the UK, this was the poster which shows a load of stars crammed into a space far too small for them. Which I think sums up the movie I saw. Well, the chief difference between the British and the Americans in terms of sense of humor is that we have one and they don't. But, on the other hand, uh, Mike Horton over there, Mike Horton over there is uh, eating that swill, so that shows a certain sense of humor, doesn't it? I knew nothing of Moldansky's other work, so I checked out his filmography. It turns out that he only made a handful of cinema-released movies, none of which I'd heard of, let alone seen. He has mostly stuck to making TV movies and directing sitcoms, which could all be masterpieces as far as I know. But I think the problem with this film is he didn't control the chaos. I'm not sure if this is a well-known phrase, but I've heard more than one director say it. If you want to be stressed, make a comedy. If you want to have a good time, make a horror. It's, it's all mysterious, you know, I mean, uh, it's mysterious business. I still will go through many days, weeks, or months where I basically feel I can't, I can't, never going to be able to, not only I'll never work again, but I really can't act anyway, so how, do, how did I even, you know, but then uh, you go try again, and, and once, the, once the juice starts to flow, it's, uh, it's that uh, transformation, feeling of life, sometimes you're on top of the mountain. It must be very hard for a director to break up five or so of the funniest people in the world and say, come on guys, we've got work to do. But that's what a comedy director has to do. This being said, I don't hate this movie. I don't think it's one of the six worst movies ever made, like John Cleese said. I don't even think it's one of the six worst John Cleese movies. There are stuff in there I like and there's stuff in there I don't. That's better than some comedies I've seen which only have the latter. This isn't a long lost Monty Python movie, it isn't a Cheech and Chong movie, it's a very silly pirate film, and no one has ever heard of one of those making money. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. Have you seen Yellowbeard? Am I actually out of my tree? Is it really the sixth worst film ever made? Why don't you let me know in the comments below? And hopefully our paths will cross again. I be Scott Kingsnorth. And I'll be making a movie.